Patch 1315 has hit the live servers and we are already seeing a pretty diverse meta when it comes to the current patch. But there are a couple of things to keep in mind and a lot of things to talk about. So let's just hop right into the meta analysis, talking about the different legends, best comps to think about, and alternative lines to consider whenever you are playing TFT on 1315. The first legend I want to briefly mention, and I'm not going to go over every single one, by the way. We're just going to go over the most noteworthy ones. But the first one is Caitlyn. If you are very into that very fast 8, high tempo, high HP preservation playstyle, Caitlyn can be the legend for you. Stars Are Born is such a disgustingly strong gold augment. Um, it is a little awkward when you are taking a legend just for their gold augment at 2-1 and literally nothing else knowledge download rolling for days these are uh, augments you don't really want to be taking in general very niche case scenarios where you ever really take these but you could it's just not that great sometimes but in general Kaylin, you really are taking it just for stars are born and nothing else starter kit is just not that great of an augment and one two threes is just mid as fuck um but still if you get stars are born though very very strong game very easy to play game you just pre-level at one three and you just get to play a strong board for the majority of stage two into stage three now the next one i want to talk about is ezreal as well I was sorry, I was deciding between Ezreal and Lee Sin. But Ezreal has sort of come back into the meta slightly. Not really. This is more just like if you prefer this playstyle. Ezreal is really all about making sure that all of your carries and your tanks are well itemized. And that's basically the whole identity of this legend. It's great that you're able to itemize everybody, but you do give up a little bit of combat power within your augments. Uh, out of all of his augments in general, tiny grab bag, big grab bag, giant grab bag, you really wouldn't take these unless you absolutely needed to. As well as well in comforts, I think the prismatic sort of the only one that is sort of agreed upon, generally speaking, that it's really good. But the rest are, you know, you wouldn't really want to take these in general. Um, and uh, what's it called? Very treasures. Great on the gold and prismatic level, but on the gray one, it's kind of mid. You can definitely find better augments for stage two one. Moving on to Lee Sin. Lee Sin now, I, I, I was a huge advocate for Lee Sin, and I still think Lee Sin can be good under the right scenarios. But do you want it every single time? Probably not. I hate to admit it. Um, Lee Sin, the big reason why he's so good is also kind of in the similar vein of Caitlyn, where trade sector can be very good for tempo. I will say, though, Stars Are Born is just better for early game and mid game tempo, and just economically speaking, it's better for you because of the six gold you get out of Stars Are Born. But nonetheless, Lee Sin with trade sector, um, it can be actually very open. OP under the right circumstances. Specifically, I'm talking about one cost rerolls. I think trade sector with one cost rerolls is absolutely disgusting. It ain't no golden ticket, but it's still really, really strong. For example, you take trade sector and you're trying to play into Samira reroll, you are going to have a pretty good time, assuming that you, you know, you're not trying to like super hard force the line, you know what I mean? Um, but other than that, it can be really nice as well because your stage 3 2, you, you can get that last duplicator in case you absolutely need it for that one cost reroll. But other than that, I don't think Lee Sin is that great. I have played Lee Sin too much. Um, I was a strong advocate for him, but now I'm sort of like a eh, play it if you want, if that's your play style. But I'm not a big one cost reroller guy, so I'm sort of waning away from Lee Sin, personally speaking. Um, next one is Orin. Orin, now this is everybody's sort of default. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people default Orin as well just because of dish soap, but Orin is just the most consistent. He's just the most consistent out of every single legend. Like, every single one of these augments are pretty takeable, except for Living Forge. It's kind of okay, but even then, you're not, like, depressed to take it, right? Um, but Orn is great. Portable Forge, there's a lot of really great Orn items at the moment. You have Eternal Winter, Trickster's Glass, Death's Defiance, DFG with units like Lux. Lots of really good uh, items that you can get out of the Forge. Sniper's Focus actually got buffed. It's actually pretty good as well. Triforce is okay. Uh, Randoids is good for early game win streaking. A lot of really good stuff that's coming out of the Forge. So you can always take Orn and never have a bad time. This is sort of everyone's default and should be everyone's default, generically speaking. But nonetheless, it doesn't have to be if that's not what your playstyle is truly about. I do highly recommend, again, we're going to go through a little more of the legends here. But if you're like, hey, like, I don't know if Orn is really for me. Personally speaking, I noticed that Orn just generically really isn't for me. Um, Feel free to experiment. I think it's a really great thing to do so because a lot, again, there's a lot of legend diversity going on at the moment. Next, Poro. Um, it's takeable, not like the best of the best, but it's takeable. But I mean, if you're gonna take Poro, you might as well just, just take Orn, in my opinion. I think it's basically the same. Um, Tom Kench sucks. I don't know why I even mentioned him real quick. Sorry about that. Earth. Earth is sort of coming back into the meta. I think this is the last one I wanted to talk about. Earth is sort of coming back into the meta because people are sort of realizing that there's actually a lot of really interesting lines that you can play when it comes to ancient archives because there are a bunch of really interesting emblems that have some very niche comps. And if you're willing to take the time to sit down and study all of them, you can have a very good time playing Earth. Now, 
Earth is probably, in my opinion, the hardest legend to play out of all of them, just because there's so many different lines to play. Like, what do you do with a Demacia Crest? What do you do with a Bastion Crest? What do you do with a Deadeye Crest? Who do you put the Deadeye Crest on? Who's the best Gunner Crest holder? Who's the best yada yada yada, right? It's all these different lines that exist. It can get very difficult very quickly, and if, unless you're really well-versed into the game, I don't know if I'll recommend it, especially if you're climbing, but if you're just trying to have fun, trying to play TFT, it's just sort of as flexibly as possible at its core, Earth is definitely a great legend to take. But that basically covers all the legends. Now let's go over all of the current comps that are sort of taking over the meta slash or comps that you should be taking aware of. First one being Noxus. Uh, Noxus is sort of time and time again shown that it is a very, very strong and consistent comp to be playing if you are trying to climb. Now, Noxus, the most common variation known is this reroll Darius Katarina line, where you reroll at seven, trying to hit the Darius three, Katarina three. Obviously, there are a couple more nuances with this comp when it comes to playing tempo. You want to play high HP preservation, trying to find that Darius two, Katarina two, six Noxus board at three, two. But of course, there are multiple multiple different ways of playing the board, but in general, you do want to play aggressively and high HP preservation is the name of the game. Also, trying to play Noxus without having a Noxus start is kind of awkward. Definitely doable nowadays because of the changes to Noxus recently, but is it like great? Uh, I don't know. I, to me personally speaking, if I don't have a Noxus start, I would not try to lean into this comp. Um, there are a bunch of variations when it comes to Noxus as well. I'm not going to go too in-depth about Noxus. We've gone over numerous times every single meta analysis, but we do have a couple of variations that exist as well, most notably with the Noxus Emblem, where you have the Noxus Echo. You're able to roll for Noxus 3, Katarina 3, Darius 3. And actually, if you're hitting a lot of Echoes, not a lot of Dariuses, you could just itemize the Echoes instead of the Darius. Darius 2, but Katarina 3, Echo 3 with Noxus Emblem, and you can still have a decent time. Uh, there is the other variation with the Azir line as well. This is the one that I believe I was sort of the one to pioneer it slash spread word of it, but I don't know if that's actually true. But Azir is really great as well because basically this line allows you to sort of stabilize your board without Darius, 2, Darius 3, Katarina 3. This is sort of the hardest part of Noxus is like how long do you have to bleed out on Darius 2, Katarina 2 until you're able to find like Darius 3, Katarina 3 and you're able to stabilize again and actually start, to, you know, kind of went out the lobby. Um, this variation allows you to, again, stabilize during that difficult time. And quite honestly, it's still my favorite variation of Noxus. I still think it's really, really cool. For whatever reason, Noxus Azir just sounds like sick as fuck. But still, very, very strong. Yes, Azir get nerfed a bit, but nonetheless, you get most of the stats through Noxus Emblem here. So you get a lot of stats through Noxus, and then you just dump a bunch of attack speed onto Azir. Shift Ginsu is BIS, and you're going to have a very grand old time. Now, out of all the variations of Noxus, though, the most recent one that came up that is sort of taking everybody by storm, at least at the beginning of the patch, was Reroll Samira. Reroll Samira is super fucking strong. I will not go over how to actually play it in this meta analysis because, again, I do want to try to keep this as short as possible. Most of the analysis are very long. But if you'd like to know more in depth about this composition in particular, I do have a 10 minute. Sorry, yes, it's like a, it's a 10 minute video on the actual comp and the theory behind it. It's 30 minutes long, but that's only because there's a whole game of like Samira afterwards of like how I played it and like how you can approach it as well. So that's why it looks like it's 30 minutes long. It's really only 10 minutes long. Um, trust if you just want to learn the theory. Uh, so please go check it out. I will link it in the description below. But that's enough about Noxus. I feel like we talk about like a shitload every time we do a meta analysis. So let's move on to Ginsu Flex. Now, Ginsu is sort of interesting where you are sort of pushed into two different lines. You can call this Ginsu Flex, you can call this AD Flex. But regardless of the AD Ginsu Flex, you are primarily playing around either Aphelios or Zeri. It's more specifically Failure to Aphelios Zeri or. Sorry, Failure to Aphelios Ergot or Failure Zeri Ergot. It's one of the two. Right, Urgot sort of is the common theme here. It is sort of connecting everything either by Zon or by Deadeye. But in the Freljord of Felios variation, you do just play Ginsu's with three Freljord. You have the Terra here for the Bastions and the Targon, Sion for the Bruisers, and Urgot. This is your main carries. LDP is super, super busted in this comp, as well as stuff like Freljord Heart. Um, I will admit, this is probably the oldest or one of the oldest comps in the fucking set. I think this was the first comp I ever played on PvE for set 9. I, I think this is pretty well versed. The only difference is that before, uh, in this patch, 
Uh, you don't put Morello on Los Angeles anymore. You actually put it on Ash because of the way they changed the way that Morello works. They can proc on any ability now. So Ash is sort of the best here because she hits the most units with her ability. So really, really good stuff. Uh, Aphelios, people have sort of realized that you really do want AD because Deadeye works best with lots of AD. So Deathblade is very, very key on this guy. Ginsu's as well. You can even, instead of going to GS, you can go double Ginsu's. That's fine as well. It depends on what you are being dropped here and what you want to play around. If you need a tank shredder, go with GS. You get the idea. Ergot likes tanky stuff. Tight BT Hodge. I mean, it's always been the same. Uh, moving on, Zeri variation. I will not take too long to talk about this, but in general, also a very, very strong variation of the board. Where again, it's basically the same. Instead, you just don't have uh, Terra on the board. You have Senna instead for Gunners, and very, very straightforward. Obviously, if you don't hit this. You just play Jace instead or Jinx too, whatever the fuck comes your way. Zeri really likes Ginsu's and GS. Again, you might notice very similar itemization to Aphelios. She can even instead of Guardbreaker can use Deathblade as well. That's fine. That's okay. Um, again, really, really strong board in terms of Zon mods that you want to keep in mind though, just in case you are thinking about playing this variation, you do want to keep in mind of the mod. The best ones uh, by far actually are Virulent as well as Robotic Arm, but some if you do roll something like Adaptive Implant instead, you can feel free to put that on Urgot as well, and he will have a grand old time. Do not sleep on Urgot, he does a shitload of damage. Now, there is finally the Gunner variation slash 4-Gunner for Zon with Pill over instead this is actually really really good nowadays especially with the changes to built over full open fort basically not it's not open fort but basically open forting your board uh with a 2-1 built over start you will probably have a very very good time um it's one of the strongest boards with the highest caps in the game definitely something to consider here your front line usually consists of the sejuani with the scion here the scion is usually actually something like vi before you hit the hybrid dinger for built over but you know what i'll just show it to you just in case you're having a hard time visualizing it but it goes vi you have the t-hex here good stuff and then eventually this just turns into hybrid dinger and you're having a grand old time right really really solid stuff now you might notice actually by the way on the the turret on the apex turret i do want to talk about this a little bit um, there is a bit of debate going on as to like what is Heimerdinger's BIS for the turret. Personally speaking, I like uh, one of each in terms of Meccano, Goldenator, Shred. I don't think self-repair is really that good in general. You used to really early on in the in the set, you would take like triple repair and you just frontline the turret here. But nowadays, um, I actually think Meccano, Goldenator into Shrink is the best combination. The Execute is just super, super nice having it a Goldenator. Plus this allows you to rebuild your economy. So having one of each is super, super dope, especially with the buffs, the Goldenator on the Execute. Really good stuff. Now, finally, I do want to mention this real quick. I did not call this AD Flex, right? You might be going like, oh, I already know all about this. I know about Zeri, I know about Felix. Everybody knows about this. What the fuck, who cares, right? I did not name this AD Flex because you actually have one final variation to talk about, which is the Azir Urgot line. This line is really interesting. I did not actually know about this line until literally earlier today. I saw Joe Bookmark playing this. Um, it isn't like a first place comp by any means, but it's still a decently strong board. And if you can hit this early on, you will definitely be able to just secure a top four, like no problem. Um, it's actually a pretty strong board. It's deceivingly strong. The idea is, is that if you miss on Zeri Aphelios, but you find a decent amount of Azir's, um, a lot of the Zeri items and Aphelios items can actually fit onto Azir. Obviously, you don't have Deathblade. That would not work. But you can maybe throw the Deathblade onto Urgot instead, and then instead try to itemize that third, last, and final item onto Azir. Azir loves a lot of bows. This is actually surprisingly pretty strong, and as the game progresses, you actually tech out a Freljord, and you just tech on a bunch of legendary stuff like Senna, stuff like a Heimerdinger, maybe even like a Scion as well if you needed that extra frontline for whatever reason. I don't think it's going to be the case here. Um, you know, you have a bunch of different ways to tech on different legendaries onto the sport and try to cap out and eventually tech into stuff like Ari, Belveth, and etc. Um, again, really, really strong board. This is something that was just not on my radar at all until today, but definitely something to consider if you find yourself in a really difficult position where you're like, hey, I want to play Zeri, I want to play Aphelios. Too many Zeri Aphelios players. I have a lot of HP, but I feel like I'm not hitting my units here. You can try to tech into the Azir line. Totally fine. Works pretty well, especially with how unpopular Azir is at the moment. Azir Lux has fallen off quite a bit in the current meta, so very, very available in most cases. Definitely something to consider. Um... Finally, let's talk about, well not finally, but the next comp we're going to talk about is for Sork. Now this, again, I do not want to talk too in-depth about this comp. I did a whole 
guide on this a little while back. I did this about nine days ago. Um, talking about the Force Orc line, this is, yes, in the Advanced TFT Aurelian Soul Legend Guide, but this composition still stands. The general theory that I will talk about this, because I did not mention this in that video, is that you want to at least be able to go level 8 here decently comfortably. It's not a roll-on 7 board by any means. The board itself is very cheap. It's very easy to transition into this board from the early to mid game to late game, but in order to do all that, you do need to hit level 8. But again, very cheap, very easy board to hit. One of my favorite defaults to go to actually in the current patch and actually last patch and the patch before that as well. This is just my favorite board of all time at the moment. It's just, it's so, so good. So, so solid. Highly recommend. Very top horrible. Very, very strong board. If you want to learn more about it, I will leave this video in the description as well. Um, I will timestamp it in the general. I believe it starts at around like five minutes. I will timestamp it so that when it's linked, you click on it, it will immediately get into the guide if you want to learn more about this composition. Next. Let's talk about Yasuo Kaisen again. It might seem like I'm going, I'm trying to go fast and trying to like, you know, get this video going. But again, I don't want this video to be too long. So going into Yasuo Kaisen. Now Yasuo Kaisen has fallen off quite, quite hard. It used to be super, super strong. The comp that everybody used to go for, you know, it was an Azir Lux, Yasuo Kaisen meta and everyone's donkey rolling at seven trying to hit these units, right? Nowadays, it's not like that anymore. And in fact, Yasuo Kaisa is now a tempo board. So what I mean by this is that, let's say you are playing Ionia throughout the early game, and then you are finding yourself like, hey, like I have so many Ionia units, I'm naturally so many Ionia items and units and lines that like I have to play Yasuo Kaisa. There's just no other way around it. It's going to be way too expensive to pivot out. I hear you. You can play it. It's scary, I know, because it's not a meta comp. You just have to think about the way, like how to approach it is just different compared to before, right? Before, you don't get rolled 7 trying to find your units, but nowadays, that isn't really the case. You would only really, you know, consider playing into this board if you have enough tempo and high HP from the early to mid game, and you can still, like, you have the units, you were playing Ionia, you might as well just tech into it, right? That is sort of the only time you really want to play into this nowadays. 6 Challenger is definitely much more popular than 6 Ionia. I will admit that 6 Ionia was sort of the default that everybody was running a couple patches ago, or maybe one or two patches. I don't remember if it was one or two patches ago. I think it was two patches ago. This was the sort of default everybody was running, but nowadays this isn't what you really want to do anymore. And instead six challenger is sort of the best way to go about it. Again, like I said before, it is a tempo board. So you're trying to hit that level eight and then trying to find your units, then trying to find the stability and then try to go nine. And you're trying to play a board that isn't as popular. So it's easier to hit the four costs, right? Now, what people have sort of realized and why six challenger is sort of quote unquote better, if you will, than six Ionia is because this board allows you to play three carries. Unlike the, the six Ionia, where you're sort of stuck with the Ari here, it's really hard to find Ari in general. This allows you to play Gwen 2. And Gwen 2 is, should not be slept on. They changed the, her formula, uh, or the AI, or whatever the fuck, or like, you know what it is. Uh, and it's actually like kind of good now. So she is, under the under the right circumstances, can be very good. And this is a very, very decent board to be top four with. Very, very good stuff here. Obviously, you don't you probably wouldn't find yourself with nine full items um, while playing this board. But the idea is, is that you're just trying to st stabilize with a decent board, get your top four, or you tempo so hard that you're able to pivot out of Ionia into a 9-5 supremacy. Um, just to give you like an idea, this is for example a board that I was playing when I was playing into the six Ionia line with the four challengers. And again, you can see that I'm I'm the last alive basically with me and this one other dude, and it was a huge huge hp lead that i was able to maintain because i played very very high tempo tech into the sport and then try to save up enough money to go nine and tech into legendaries as you can see this is my board on six seven right it's sort of a mid-ass board but i'm bleeding out this whole time for the most part um i snuck a win uh you can see at the bottom but that was, that was super super lucky um but as you can see like as the game progresses here um oh the game's already over here um but as you can see um like I'm basically just trying to pivot my board into like a legendary board. I should have planned this a little better. Um, but as you can see here, like all my eyes are on my bench here, but my, my board, this is the same game, same game. I pivoted my board. This is seven one now, just one round later. I pivoted my board into a nine five supremacy, Senna two, RE two, Balveth two with like BIS, Heimer with BIS mods and like all this other crap on my board, right? The idea, again, you want to transition out as soon as you can. You want to play high tempo and then transition out. You basically get the fast nine sometimes. If not, you play at level eight, slow transition out with a bunch of legendaries, and that's basically the board. Um, finally, though, I do want to talk a little bit about this legendary line, the Bill Gates line, um, because somebody in my stream earlier today had asked me, how do you actually play Bill Gates, right? You hear everybody talking about, oh, just click on the golden units. Oh, just click on five cost units, and like that's all that there is to it. Um, 
there's a bit more to it than that. And I do want to talk a little bit about how to actually play Bill Gates because first off, you're typically transitioning into it pretty quickly, at least within one round. So you have to have at least some level of a game plan going into it, not just like, I'm just going to click on gold units and hope for the best, right? So let's talk about it. First off, the Bill Gates board has a core. It has a very strong core that you cannot ignore. Bill Gates core is Belvet 2, RE2, Shen 2, Karma, right? This is sort of the core and actually Karma should be frontline. Um, this is the core every single time. RE2, Belvet 2, Shen, Karma. If you know you're about to pivot to a level nine board and you need to roll down quickly, you should have one Shen, one Karma ideally on bench. That way, when you do your roll down, you're able to roll down, find all of these other units, and everything else is basically flex. You can take in Scion, you can take in the Rise, take in the Senna, take in a Sejuani for Bruisers, take in, you know, whatever. Uh, Aatrox as well, really good stuff. Take in the Heimerdinger for the turret, right? Keep filling in the unit slots, trying to find whatever you need in order to try and get this board online, right? But I will say, though, it's that, one, first off, you might notice I'm struggling a little bit. That's because Cassante looks like he fits on the board. He actually fucking doesn't. That unit is shit. I don't care what anybody says. Cassante 2 is fake fucking news. Terrible unit. Um, second of all, again, th the, the board itself, very, very flexible, but you do need to keep this like core in mind um i did say earlier karma needs to be frontlined as well uh she shouldn't be down here she should actually be up here the reason why is just because you don't want her to steal the ionia bonus just the way that the trait works from ari so you want her to kind of die like asap she's really just a trait bot and the little really tiny minuscule bit of damage that you get out of this karma if you keep her in the back line is so minuscule it's just not worth it just she dies it's fine everyone's happy um if you want a bit more of like an example as to like what it looks like when you're planning for these roll downs, just recently, I believe it's actually the video right before this, but I did have a game where I actually had to do a fast nine pivot. Um, I'll bring it up over here. I will also link this video as well in the description if I can remember. But in this game, for example, I'm just going to mute it as well because I hate hearing my own voice. But as you can tell, this is a game where, you know, I have this in mind, right? I have my Ari items in mind. I have my Belveth items in mind here, right? I know for a fact I have to roll down at, like I have to roll down like 150 gold in this one turn and try to do everything, right? So I'm trying to plan this out as soon as I can. Again, Ari items, I have the Shen, I have the Karma, and I have a BT ready for my Belveth, right? And so if we just watch the clip, uh, I'll just put this at 2x speed so you don't have to sit through it. But the idea is again, as you can see, we're trying to pick up the units, trying to find Belvets, trying to find the core, trying to find filler units as well. Obviously clicking on all the gold units, but strong filler units like Gen 2, or sorry, not Shen 2, Sejuani 2, Jarvan 2, stuff like that, right? We're trying to find all these units, trying to pivot our board as soon as possible, making sure everything is itemized properly, keeping the Cassante off the board because this unit is fake as fuck. And, you know, that's like the pivot, right? That's the end game pivot right here. Uh, but you get the idea, right? Like this is sort of what you are looking for whenever you're trying to do these large transitions because they can be very, very difficult to do within a certain, like within a single round if you don't know exactly what you're doing, right? good stuff but anyways now that we finished talking about bill gates as well how to approach that let's finally talk about alternative lines now for whatever reason people think that the current meta is like it's four sorks it's aphelios it's zeri and like that's it i do not fully agree i think there's actually a bunch of really cool alternative lines that do exist but you need the right spot for them obviously you can't play them every single day like you can't play them every single time but you can play them if you are given the opportunity to do so i actually went first in a game playing garen reroll the other day like believe it or not i had a garen two at like two what like stupid as fuck but i was like whatever i guess i'll play it i had a Gensu slam and a garen like why not try it right it's fine you would be surprised garen three star averages like a 3.74 it's actually okay and if you actually look over here in like a seven demacia line with reroll sona reroll garen three like it actually has like decent stats like there's actually a decent amount of different lines just to give you an idea this is what the seven demacia board would look like you're playing around sona three and garen three you re-roll for these two three start and you just pump level go level eight right this is just the board you're just taking an atrox at eight um it's a line it's something you can play i don't i think people are sort of like very prejudiced against playing any other line it is sort of an echo box going on right now but you have a bunch of different lines that you can play this is for example the garen reroll line as well that they're available they're available if you look for them and or rather if you just keep an open mind to them if you're saying like hey i hit a bunch of garions oh what a low roll like no like you can play it don't be afraid to do so if your components say it's okay you're in a spot that's actually acceptable of it consider playing it 
I highly recommend considering playing it because it's definitely, definitely possible. Just for another example, Kassadin in 3, 4.03, really great as well. Riftwalker can succeed in a lot of different scenarios. You hit the Kassadin in 3, you hit the Soraka 3 as well. Obviously, I can't find the stat data if I am currently, you know, stat augment data is still gone. But they're changing that in the mid set though. Thank you, Mort. But uh, until then, we don't know what the actual average is with Riftwalk alone. But I mean, with or without, it's still averaging 3.68 just based off the units. Really, really solid stuff. Finally, like another... Uh, line that exists as well as Bastion of Felios. Definitely something to consider. I know Shunji, who is like the uh, like set seven world champion, really disgustingly strong player on the Chinese server. He like defaults this line. He defaults for Bastion of Felios. Like you would be like, what? Default for Bastion? Yeah. Like he does. He's actually kind of a nut. Like if you really don't believe me, I'll link this in the description as well. This is Froden's stream, but he was VOD reviewing Shunji. This is from two days ago. But he was VOD reviewing Shunji playing this line, and you can see he's already in a crazy plus 71 HP on a nine win streak, playing six Bastions. Um, obviously he has two emblems here, but in like the following game afterwards, he's actually only playing four bat, three Targon, four Bastion, and he actually I think he does really really well in this game, and he's still average. I think he goes like second in the end, not to spoil anything. But he does a really good job playing this line. Really, really cool line to be playing. Six Bastion averaging 3.87, four averaging uh, 4.4. This is what the board would look like in general. This is the board that Shunji was playing with four Bastion. But again, it's a really solid, solid line that you can definitely consider if you have the spot for it. Now, again, are you going to be able to play these lines every single time? No. But please stop. Like, I've had people be like, oh, like, you have to play Aphelios or Zeri, and that's, like, all there is to it. Like, no, dude, there's a bunch of different lines that you can play. Do not sleep on them. Keep an open mind. The patch is a lot more balanced than you think. Anyways, that's going to be it for this meta-analysis. I hope you guys learned something. Take care, guys, and happy climbing.